I can forget that what I did changed baby Suggs's life. No clearing, no company, just laundry and shoes. I can forget it all now because as soon as I got the gravestone in place, you made your presence known in the house and worried us all to distraction. I didn't understand it then. I thought you were mad with me. And now I know that if you was, you ain't now, because you came back here to me and I was right all along. There is no world outside my door. I only need to know one thing. How bad is the scar? Hello and welcome once again to the Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And this time we have read Toni Morrison's Beloved. And we read it all by itself, as opposed to in the clusters where we've been reading things all together. We're reading this all alone. Yes, and we're reading it because the year is drawing to a close. We're looking back at the year. We're looking back at the year and we're thinking about Toni Morrison, who passed away this year. Mm. And we thought this was a good opportunity to read one of her most, well, beloved works. Pun not quite intended, I guess. And to remember. And to remember and to, and to, and to pay attention to her. Mm-hmm. Um, I am very anxious about talking about this book mm. for a number of reasons. First off, it's a very difficult book on many levels. Mm-hmm. It is a book that I'm not an expert on. I, I've only finally got around to reading it after she passed this summer. Mm-hmm. And it was fantastic. And I have now read it again for, the, for this recording. But... You know, I don't speak with this with any kind of authority. It's also a very challenging book in that it's very graphic. Mm. It's very upsetting. I mean, it talks about very upsetting things, which is not necessarily a reason to not read it or talk about it, but it's something to keep in mind. And it's a book that's full of pain. You know, I was thinking about this a lot getting ready for today. A lot of times if I read a book and I empathize with uh, the the first person voice or one of the characters, I feel positive about that because I feel like I'm drawn together with the person. And in this book, any time there was one of those moments of empathy, like especially around the the parent child relation, it almost felt like an insult to have that empathy because the hardship that that you're reading about of these figures, like there's such a huge gulf. In experience. So, so normally, like feeling empathy feels like a very positive and affirmative thing. And uh, every time I felt it, my first feeling of empathy, I'd feel positive and then I'd feel bad, like <laughs> over yeah. and over again. It's strange. No, I, I, I totally get that. This is this book is filled with characters who are like people who you like, but who are, I mean, beyond broken, mm, mm, mm. Who, who've had very difficult lives. And the idea of sort of wanting to spend time with them, which you can feel about similarly interesting people that you encounter in other books, feels somewhat different here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. That you feel like you want to spend time with them, but you feel like, or at least I, right, feel like a stranger, right? So so it's an odd thing where you're drawn in and yet there's a gap, right? Um, it's a really powerful read. Well, and the other thing that makes me feel uncomfortable or going into this perhaps is a is a clip that was going around from an interview with Toni Morrison mm-hmm. back in the 80s or 90s or something but it was being passed around a lot in in my circles when she passed which was an interview where Morrison was asked an insensitive question by an interviewer basically was asked the question when are you going to write a book about white people mm, yeah I saw that uh. yeah and and said well th- my books aren't for white people no I'm writing books for black women Mm -hmm. And so there's a sense in which I feel like, you know, this book isn't for me in that sense. Like it's not, I can, I'm, you know, I'm going to say things. You can read it. You can say things about it, but it's not for you. Yeah. And I don't, I don't want anyone listening to think that I'm trying to take up that critical space on it. No. I, I'm reading it and I'm appreciating it. Hopefully. I mean, I thought, think it's a fantastic book, Mm. but I'm not spending this hour talking with you, both of us as, you know, white people, mm-hmm. uh, trying to to lay down that that definitive claim on anything. No. Um, so I feel awkward going into it. That said, I think, tell me if I'm wrong. I think that there's a, it's it's a capacious book, right? It's a table with plenty of room to sit at. The question is whether you're kind of putting yourself in front or you're understanding that you're at the periphery. And maybe, maybe it's the case that if you understand where you are, that you're at the periphery, you know, maybe that's the ground on which you can approach it. Yeah. I don't feel, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. 
and I'm happy to be corrected if I am wrong, but I don't feel like when she was saying that, that Morrison was no. disinviting mm-hmm. white readers or non-black mm-hmm. readers from, mm-hmm. from reading her books and, and enjoying them and talking about them, just understanding that, you know, this isn't, They're not this for, isn't you. for you. Yeah, so if you yeah, have a yeah. problem with it. Too bad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's right. So that being said, we're going to be talking about some difficult things. So if you're not in the mood for that, that's fine. You can, you know, save this episode for when you're ready for it. I, we we have to say it's um, violent death of a child as as content warning, right? And I feel strongly we have to say this because you know we might talk about this later. Like I only read this book now, and the reason I only read this book now is I set out to read it probably around 1990, 91, right when my first two daughters were born. I couldn't read it. I got like about ten pages in. I just could not read it. And it's amazing. I'm really happy to have read it now. But I, at that time, I just couldn't. So content warning. I feel like now it's important for us to acknowledge the painfulness and the darkness and the content warning part of this. But also to say at the outset, it's a book that also has these moments of joy and extraordinarily beautiful writing and poignancy and intimacy. I mean, some of the most beautiful writing I've ever seen. Um, and we'll talk about that too. Oh yeah, it is not sort of a slog through. Oh no, through sort of cruelty porn or anything no. like that. It's it's very very well written, very well modulated. The violence is very delicately written. I know that sounds like a crazy thing to say, but it's the violence is very tenderly and delicately. Like I don't mean that we don't perceive it as violence and graphic. It, it how can I put it? Violence. In, in writing or in film, right? Often communicates anger, right? I mean, it's, it's violence motivated by hate and anger and all those things, right? The violence that happens here is the violence that comes of desperation. You know, is it murder or is it salvation, right? What, what, what is it that happens? So there's an act of violence, but what motivates it is very different from what we usually see. Yes, although there's plenty of violence outside of that central act. Oh, absolutely. As you'd expect from a novel that takes place in the South during and before and after the Civil War, uh, there's a lot of violence. Yeah, in the South, that is, uh, we're in Cincinnati for the the current time period of this book. So Ohio, right? Um, but um, the history that's unfolded for us that emerges through remembering um, in the course of the novel, yeah, that's 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 the South. Different parts of the South. So I guess we should start, as we usually do, by saying a little bit about the author. Mm-hmm. Um, Tony Morrison had what seems like, on paper at least, like a perfectly lovely life in many ways. I mean, she was born in a working class family in Lorain, Ohio in 1931. And there were some difficult racialized incidents when she was young. But she went to college to the historically black Howard University. And she got a master's afterwards at Cornell, writing a thesis on Virginia Woolf's and William Faulkner's treatment of the alienated, which is interesting. And also, I think uh, her style reflects careful reading of those two authors quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And then she taught at Howard for several years before becoming the first black female fiction editor at Random House in the late 60s. And she helped to publicize a number of black writers, um, which was important work, although not necessarily the most commercially successful work. But her own First novel, The Bluest Eye, was published in 1970, and she wrote uh, several novels afterwards, Sula, Song of Solomon, Tar Baby, leading to a point where she could finally leave publishing work and focus on writing and also some teaching, but mostly writing in 1983, which is when she begins working on Beloved in earnest. And in the introduction to Beloved, she talks about the sort of shock of liberation of becoming a full-time writer. What should she do with her time now that there's no boss over her? And, you know, it's all her time. What does she do with it? And in a larger sense, like, what does it mean to be free? Especially for women. You know, there were lots of questions around feminism in in the air. But, like, now that she has suddenly found herself more free, what did that mean for her? And that line of thought, along with some other things, led to her most celebrated novel, Beloved, the novel we're going to be talking about today, which came out in 1987 and did very well. It was a huge bestseller. It led to her winning the Nobel Prize in in literature in 1993. And she just continued writing novels in the following decades, wrote some other literary forms, some plays, some children's books, 
an opera libretto, some critical essays. She did more teaching. And she passed away this August from complications of pneumonia at the age of 88. She wasn't a person who was interested in writing autobiography. And I understand that in some of her writing workshops and things like that, she would tell students, I, I don't care about you. <laughs> like, I don't want to have, I don't want to hear anything about your life. Go and do some research, look at some history, think about people other than you, hmm. and then bring that to the page. And it seemed like much of her work was historically inflected. Certainly beloved is. It's interesting reading her writing where she describes her process. I mean, there's absolutely that, I don't want to say studious, there's that kind of research-based aspect to it where she amasses a, a body of knowledge and then translates that into fiction. But she also alludes to this, I don't know what to call it, almost mystical way of approaching writing where she kind of, need, she says she needs to know where it's going to end in order to begin. And with regard to Beloved in particular, she describes seeing as if she were seeing the woman in the dress and the hat. And, and, it's, and it's that moment of vision that then precipitates the novel. So on the one hand, it's the product of this hard work and research, but on the other hand, it's also the product of this kind of seeing. Which I find that really interesting account of writerly experience. Mm, yes. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the plot of Beloved? I will. And it's, it, I want to say it's a complicated plot. It doesn't feel complicated when you read it. It's, it's really effortless, it seems to me, the ways in which the backstory unfolds, the ways in which we are offered bits and pieces of the historical past. We're in the years after the Civil War in Cincinnati, Ohio. And when we begin the book, we begin right in the middle of things with these words. 124 was spiteful, full of a baby's venom. The women in the house knew it, and so did the children. So at the very beginning of the book, we know that we're in a house where strange things are happening. You know, when we have a sentence like this, full of a baby's venom, right? It's like babies are like, we think, innocent, charming little things, not things that have venom, right? So we immediately know we're in this dangerous, but very strangely dangerous environment in the middle of things, in a household that has two women in it, baby Suggs, uh, an older woman, and her son's wife, Setha, along with Setha's children, two boys, Howard and Bugler, and a daughter, Denver. And the house is behaving in an outrageous way, is the way it's described. Um, strange things are happening. It's kind of haunted or possessed. The sons leave the house, and then baby Suggs dies soon after, leaving Sethe and her daughter Denver alone. Sort of alone, anyway. And then Paul D., one of the men Sethe had known 18 years ago when they were back at Sweet Home, enslaved, appears in the town, and they get to know one another again. They talk about the time that they had spent together back at Sweet Home, along with Seth's husband, Hallie, some of the other men there. And we get backstory in this first encounter of Paul D. and Sethe, but also repeatedly throughout the narrative. Sethe and Paul D. become intimate. Paul D. moves in with Sethe and her daughter, Denver. And they go to a fair where things seem to be really coming together. And then when they get home from the fair, everything falls apart. Uh, as they get back to the house, they find a woman who has soft and new hands, feet, and skin. And when they ask her her name, she says, Beloved. She moves into the house and everything changes. Paul D. leaves as more and more of the past emerges and he's slowly, almost seamlessly kind of forced out of the house. Denver, Sethe's daughter, is protective of Beloved, but over time, Beloved gravitates more and more to Sethe, squeezing out Denver until things finally come to a tremendous crisis. And in that moment, the tragedy of the death of Sethe's two-year-old child, her other daughter, 18 years ago, gets played out again. After this catastrophe happens at the end, Beloved is gone. Denver is no longer isolated within the home. She's working. She becomes part of the community. And Paul D. returns. He finds Sethe in bed, something like baby Suggs was at the beginning of the novel when she was um, nearing the end of her life. In the last chapter of the book, we're left with a kind of remembering, a kind of a looking back at the events of the whole novel with the repeated phrase, this is not a story to pass on. Mm -hmm. Which is a very strange and enigmatic way to end, right, with this repeated phrase, because it's a story that is being passed on, but it's also forbidden in some kind of way. I mean, I don't know how to put it more clearly than that. In summarizing this, I found it hard not to give the words of the opening and close because that so much gives you a sense of the, I don't know what to call it, the power of the language in shaping your experience as a reader. I think one of the tricky things about doing a summary of this is, as as we've touched upon, it's not told in a chronological order at no. all. 
There's so much backstory. There's kind of a through line of things that have happened from roughly when Paul D. arrives at the house to after that catastrophe. And quite a lot of the middle part is the interaction of Beloved as she enters the house and mm -hmm. and how she connects with the various people in the house. Connects and polarizes. Yeah, and changes the relationships between them all mm -hmm. and is a weird force unto herself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But constantly we're being thrown back into the past. Constantly we're being reminded of things that happened many years ago. Yeah, as individual figures remember this or that part of the past yeah. or talk about it. So it's a novel that's always slipping into memory, slipping into many years in the past. And also the house is haunted, but the people are haunted. They're haunted by their individual past, but they're also haunted by this collective past of slavery, right? And, and all that it implies and all that it's done. We haven't talked about what or who Beloved is, which if anybody's listening who hasn't read the novel, is, is surely a, a thing that they might not realize that they're supposed to be thinking about. Well, there's two beloveds, right? I mean, there's Seth's two-year-old child that dies in her arms, right? Bleeds to death in her arms. And then there's the woman who appears 18 years later, and she's also called beloved. And on the one hand, we're meant to understand this beloved as a kind of re-embodiment or an almost reincarnation, you know, a new coming into flesh of baby beloved, right? Of toddler beloved, who was just learning to crawl. But we're also kind of suspended in a state of uncertainty. We don't know exactly what the story is. We don't know for sure if this was this reincarnated child, or if this was some strange woman who has some other kind of narrative, who's just come into contact with Setha and her family, um, and they've sort of shaped themselves around one another. I mean, that possibility is offered to us too. And I think Purposely, I don't think we're meant to definitely see this as a kind of a horror story of this baby coming back. I think we're offered the possibility of seeing it as another kind of story, too. That could also be true. I don't know. Do you think that's possible? Like, there's this one moment in the novel where some characters says they had heard about a young girl who had been kept prisoner in a house and who had escaped from there sometime and nobody knew what had happened to her. Right, who had escaped at about the same time that she showed up. Yeah, as if this could be perhaps another way of explaining what's happening here. Yeah, I think the novel offers some potential alternate explanations for who and what Beloved is, but also offers a lot of evidence to suggest that no, this is a this is a return of that spirit. Mm -hmm. She knows things that she shouldn't otherwise know. She knows songs that Setha would have sung only to her children and made up only for her children. Exactly. And it's interesting in the introduction to this edition, Toni Morrison talks about when she was trying to figure out how to shape this material, this historical figure, into a novel. It wasn't until she had, so to speak, a vision of the murdered child coming out of the water, climbing the rocks and looking at her, so to speak, that she was like, oh no, the, the murdered child has to have a say, has to be in this. Mm -hmm. uh, it feels like she's saying, no, this is, this is the reading. The reading is that this is the child come back. This, it's important for her to be part of this narrative. You are meant to understand her as, as this. This is how she's functioning as a sort of grown-up two-year-old. She's the only one who can render judgment, right? I mean, that's the whole point, right? She's the only one who can really determine what it was that happened. Yeah, and it's important for her voice to be part of it. That's it. So it's interesting that sort of the paratext makes things clearer, that the text seems to go out of its way to keep unsure. To keep open, I think, a little bit. Yeah, to keep open. Um, and I wonder if you what you think that does. Like, what does it do to make it unsure whether this is actually a return of the baby? It seems to me that it makes it so much more powerful. You know, if it's a story where it's locked down and we know for sure exactly what's happening, where there's not uncertainty, right? That's much less terrifying and much less moving than a story where you kind, you're pretty sure you know what's happening, but you're not, you know, the ground is shifting under your feet, right? It's only a very, very skillful writer who can put you in that place where the ground is stable enough that you're oriented, like you, you, you're oriented in the narrative, but you're not quite sure. You're not quite certain. And that I think is so much more powerful. 
right? Because you're trying to make sense of it. You're always trying to make, it's not given to you. You're always trying to make sense of what's going on. You're always doubting yourself. You're always looking again for a bit more information, a bit more clarity, a bit another clue. Yeah, you're not quite sure. I think that's very deliberate. Mm. Now, I wonder, as I was rereading this this time and thinking about this haunting and this sort of weird woman who shows up on the door mysteriously, is this a horror novel? I think, I mean, it's not only a horror novel, but one of the things it is, I think, is that. Because there are these moments, these like terrifying moments, these uncanny, frightening moments. Yeah. And I don't, like, I'm not, I'm not an expert on horror. So I neither want to say this is only a horror novel, mm. nor do I want to say that horror novels can't do the kinds of work that this novel is doing. Mm -hmm. Horror novels can get at all sorts of things. But I felt more and more we sort of wishing I did know more about horror novel tropes to see how this was playing with them, how this was interacting with them. I'd, I'd love to hear from some of my horror aficionado friends to talk more about that if they've read this book. And a great place to look at that would be this one moment when Beloved and Denver, the daughter of Sethe, are in the cold room. Do you remember that? And there's this um, moment where they're looking into the shadows and Beloved says something about, you know, seeing herself looking back in the shadows. Like, there's this, you know, eyes in the shadows. That's a real horror trope, right? Um, so there's the, there are certain moments that are evoking that. Sure. And this is a, this was also the moment when Denver is looking out for her in the dark. Yeah. And suddenly, suddenly Beloved has disappeared mm -hmm. in this inexplicable way. And then reappears. And then reappears, just as inexplicably. Yeah. And so that feels like it's a very horror trope thing to do. Mm -hmm. I'd be curious to hear how this is understood from horror specialists. But it's all, it's other things too. You know, it's not a historical novel in the sense that it doesn't hold scrupulously to the historical past, but it reworks and reimagines elements of the historical past, right? So that's another genre that it's participating in. Yeah. In the introduction to the novel that's in the copy that we read, Toni Morrison describes coming across a newspaper clipping when she was compiling a, a text called The Black Book about the story of Margaret Garner, who was a young woman, I'm just quoting her here, a young mother who, having escaped slavery, was arrested for killing one of her children and trying to kill the others, rather than let them be returned to the owner's plantation. And her sanity and lack of repentance caught the attention of the abolitionists, as well as newspapers. She was certainly single-minded, and judging by her comments, she had the intellect, the ferocity, and the willingness to risk everything for what was, to her, the necessity of freedom. And that describes both Seth's situation, that mm -hmm. sort of is the centerpiece of the book, mm -hmm. as well as her perspective on it, mm -hmm. right? She's being very single-minded. She's being very sane and, and, and ferocious. Purposeful. And per very purposeful when she kills her two-year-old daughter, mm -hmm. when the slave catchers are at the door, so to speak. Yeah. And that phrase seems to me so powerful, the necessity of freedom. I mean, so, you know, this question of, you know, the, the death of that child, do we call that murder? You know, uh, it, it feels just wrong to call it that because it's motivated by the necessity of freedom, right? It's an act of preservation, right? Or, or at least arguably, right? I mean, it's impossible to understand it only as one thing. It's a situation that's terrible to think on, mm. and there doesn't seem to be an obvious right answer for what Setha should have done in that situation, and the book is exploring that. Certainly, like all the people around her don't agree with her decisions. No. Other people who might have risked being caught by slave catchers and being returned to slavery who wouldn't have wanted that for themselves or their children, mm -hmm. don't feel like they would have done the same thing in those shoes, are not sympathetic in that way. Well, the crucial distinction here for Sethe is that Morrison draws this out in, in detail. She has a month where she's living at 124. She's living in a state of freedom, by which I mean not only that she's recovering from her physical wounds, that she's living in a household with her children, with her husband's mother, you, you know, getting it to a normal level. But I mean that she's, for the first time, able to be a mother to her children 
in the way she might like to be, right? Where, where she's perceiving the necessity of freedom, not just the desirability of freedom, but because of inhabiting it, the necessity of freedom. In one of um, Morrison's essays in her book, The Source of Self-Regard, she talks about this in this really powerful way, not only in terms of freedom, but in terms of what that freedom would constitute. And she says this, she says, suppose having children, being called a mother was the supreme act of freedom, not its opposite. Suppose instead of being required to have children because of gender, slave status, and profit, one chose to be responsible for them, to claim them as one's own, to be, in other words, not a breeder, but a parent. And she goes on to say, this kind of act was an expression of intolerable female independence. It was freedom. And if the claim extended to infanticide, for whatever reason, noble or crazed, it could and did become politically explosive. So Seth, what's what's brought her to this moment of clarity and purposefulness is not simply the fact of being enslaved and the desire for freedom. It's having been able to live for a month in this state of freedom, which for her includes or is comprised of, at least in large measure, of being able to be a mother in a particular kind of way. I think, don't you think, I find that fascinating. It's a thought I'd never entered my mind before. Yeah. She doesn't want to give that up. And she wants to be able to provide freedoms for her children at any cost. She doesn't want them to live enslaved. Right. She she won't allow that to happen. Exactly. Oh. But yeah, but that but that phrase of politically explosive is very true. I mean, that is sort of what the novel is about, is dealing with the aftermath of the explosion from 18 years later, how that has affected everybody involved. Mm-hmm. Well, how that has affected, maybe not how that has affected the slave owners or the wannabe slave owners, but, you know, and of course the book doesn't want to offer easy answers. Yeah. And and it offers you these windows over and over again into the state of freedom. You know, we've been talking about freedom as as a hard thing, as a thing that may require extreme sacrifice, right? But freedom shows up in in other moments, too, where it's like a kind of a, a window into joy, right? So there are a number of examples of this, but one example of this happens relatively early in the book when she's with Paul D and they've been, you know, sort of reminiscing. They haven't seen one another for 18 years and they, they go to bed together. And there's this fascinating passage, which is very beautiful, very poetic, but is also incredibly important in terms of how it constitutes this state of intimacy and freedom. So it says this, looking at Paul D's back, she remembered that some of the corn stalks broke, folded down over Hallie's back, and among the things her fingers clutched were husk and corn silk hair. How loose the silk, how jailed down the juice. So in this passage, she's recalling the, the first night that she slept with her husband, Hallie, but she's remembering that as she lies in bed with Paul D. Um, and a little later in the passage, we're no longer inside of Seth's mind. We're now inside of Paul D's mind, right? But it just seamlessly moves over. So now Paul D couldn't remember how finely they cooked those ears too young to eat. What he did remember was parting the hair to get to the tip, the edge of his fingernail just under, so as not to graze a single kernel. The pulling down of the tight sheath, the ripping sound always convinced her it hurt. As soon as one strip of husk was down, the rest obeyed and the ear yielded up to him its shy rose, exposed at last. How loose the silk! How quick the jailed up flavor ran free. No matter what all your teeth and what fingers anticipated, there was no accounting for the way that simple joy could shake you. How loose the silk, how fine and loose and free. This is such an interesting passage, right? There's that repetition. It's almost like liturgy or something, right? Where you repeat passages from scripture. Um, it's almost holy, right? And there's joy, right? There's this simple joy of the eating the, the young uh, ear of corn. Or, you know, being in that moment of sexual love, right? But it's a moment that brings together that past moment and the present moment and Seth's union with Hallie and her union now with Paul D. And it's almost the same moment, but it's also a very different, like we're, we're in very different places then and now. So, and the fact that we're within the subjectivity of each person in Seth's mind and in Paul D's mind, again, brings together those two moments in time. So, so I, the reason I emphasize, because it's a book that like when we're describing, it must sound like people would be like, oh my God, it sounds so incredibly dark and awful and miserable, but it's also staggeringly beautiful. And both the, the horror and the beauty are both grounded on freedom, 
Mm. Which I think is really interesting. Yeah, no, this is a very interesting passage. As as you say, it, it jumps around from one person's perspective to another, but it also jumps from literal memory of an event to metaphorical memory of it. Mm-hmm. So you've got, again, looking at Paldi's back, she remembered that some of the corn stalks broke, folded down over Hallie's back. Now, Hallie and her had their first sexual encounter in a cornfield, thinking that they would be hidden and protected and no one would see them. But of course, it was a little too early in the corn season and they were totally being watched. Well, by... it's because it's because the uh, the the stalks of corn shake, right? So it's like a banner almost, right? Nobody can miss what's going on in the field. Exactly. It draws all the other all the various uh-huh, paws uh-huh. and whatnot in. And uh-huh. they're totally watching this and getting turned on by watching this deflowering happen. Uh-huh. And then they broke some of the corn in the process, and they can't leave that kind of mark. So they had to take that corn and eat it. So this is the feast of new corn that they allowed themselves that night. Mm -hmm. But then they're thinking about how they cooked those ears too young to eat. Now, Setha had been, I think, 14 when this happened. That's right. So she's quite young herself, and this is still this initiation thing. And this very careful parting the hair to get to the tip and the, and getting it out so as not to graze a single kernel. This very delicate way of treating the food, both because, you know, it's a delicate young thing mm-hmm. like Setha, but also mm-hmm. because it's food that you're going to eat and this is illicit and you're not going to waste any of it. Mm-hmm. So you want to make sure not to hurt any of the kernels, not to lose any of them. Mm-hmm. And then we get back to the pulling down of the tight sheath. The ripping sound always convinced her it hurt. So we jump back into her perspective That's for a right. moment. Uh, and then right back into his. And it's the sort of thing which on paper sounds like the sort of thing that you're told as a as a beginning creative writer not to do, not to jump around in perspectives like this. But it's done so fluidly and so masterfully mm-hmm. that it just it's just works and it's just this sensuous interplay. And in this scene, of course, which is uh, you know, sexual congress, you know. It totally makes sense that these bodies and these memories are intertwining and, and sliding up against each other and, and mm. losing their their concrete subjectivity. Yeah. And you know, now that we're talking about it, it dawns on me that this moment that happens relatively early in the novel is a kind of a counterpart and also in some ways a foreshadowing of the kind of fusion that we'll see later on, uh, not of Paul D. and Setha anymore, but of Setha and Beloved, when the emotional center of gravity of the house is completely shifted um, and Beloved is uh, absorbing more and more and more of the emotional energy, everything that that household has to offer. Do have a similar kind of sort of confusion, you know, like fusion together of people's subjectivities. The other interesting thing about that passage is, of course, that this is Setha's first time having sex and having this kind of physical intimacy in 18 or so years. Mm -hmm. So it is sort of like she is, I don't want to say losing your virginity again. That's a terrible cliche. No, but but it's another beginning, right? Yeah. Suddenly it's all new again. And Mm -hmm. it's in a different context, right? She's, She's now free. That's right. And she's able to enjoy it in a different way. She's able to sort of choose to do this in a, in a much more real sense than perhaps, you know, she did get to choose which of the men on the farm she wanted, but she got to choose that at five. And that's not much of a choice. But now it feels like she's, you know, she's, I don't want to say waited, but it's been 18 years and she's deciding to have sexual intimacy with Paul D now. And it feels like something that she is choosing to do Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and all the tastier for it. (laughs) You know, this fusion of time or this confusion of time that we see in this moment of intimacy is just one of the moments that emerges in the course of the novel where where we're in two different times. And by saying that, I mean, it's, I don't mean simply that we have flashbacks or rememberings or discussions of things that have happened in the past. Like that backstory emerges over and over again at different moments. We also get moments where something funny has happened to time. In a couple of occasions, this is expressed when um, we move from being in the past tense, like into the present tense. So for example, we mentioned already this eerie sort of almost horror 
genre kind of moment where Denver and Beloved are in the cold house, sort of a um, an, an outbuilding, right, of, of the house um, where things might be stored and so on, right? Um, and so when they're out in the cold house, we move into the present tense quite suddenly. We're inside Denver's sens- sensibility right now. If she stumbles, she is not aware of it because she does not know where her body stops, which part of her is an arm, a foot, or a knee. She feels like an ice cake torn away from the solid surface of the stream, floating on darkness, thick and crashing against the edges of things around it, breakable, meltable, and cold. So it's a, it's an odd moment for a number of ways, but above all in that change of time, like it, we register that we're in a place where something strange can happen. And what's going to happen is that, as we mentioned earlier, Beloved is going to disappear and reappear in this almost kind of, I don't know, portal-like or gateway-like kind of environment. The other place that it happens, this movement into the present tense, is when we get this series of chapters late in the novel that are said to be the thoughts of the women in the house. So we get one chapter that's from Setha's perspective, you know, her interior monologue, kind of one that's from Denver's perspective, and then two that seem to sort of be coming from Beloved's own perspective, um, but it's it, it's the language is increasingly fragmented, and it's difficult to know where we are and to orient ourselves. But the, t- the change in the tenses, again, remind us that we're in a kind of a liminal space, an in-between portal-like space, like we were in in the cold house. It's interesting that you say that it's an interior monologue. When you were reading those chapters, how did you imagine they were, they were happening? I just heard them as voices. Shortly before that first chapter, that Seth's chapter, mm-hmm. there's a, a section where Seth is sort of walking home from work, as I recall. Mm -hmm. And she's got a lot on her mind. And so she's walking and she has a whole flashback to something else. It all happens in the space of a short walk. So you're sort of primed, I think, for thinking of this as like the thoughts you're having as you're getting from point A from point B, that that it's sort of happening in real time. So when you get to the first of these four chapters, uh-huh. you've just experienced that. But I think these are happening in a very different kind of space. Mm. Well, it's really insistent um, in the chapter just before when we're being set up for it, that these are mixed in with the voices surrounding the house, with the thoughts of the women of 124, unspeakable thoughts unspoken. So I took what follows, the four chapters that follow, as the unspeakable thoughts, like their voice, but they're unspeakable, you know, like how can I put it? The words that are in your mind, but you don't say out loud. See, I think they're not even the words that are in your mind. Oh. I think they're sort of more like if you could put the thoughts in your head into the words in your mind. Hmm. I mean, stream of consciousness is a tricky term, right? Because it often implies these are the words that are running through your head. Hmm. But when I was reading these, I kept thinking, mm, this isn't really what these words would sound like. It's in their voices, but it's not quite... Like the time is all off. It's in the vernacular because they're very vernacular, right? Like the first one starts, beloved, she my daughter, she mine. See, she come back to me of her own free will and I don't have to explain a thing. And then the second one starts, beloved is my sister. I swallowed her blood right along with my mother's milk. The first thing I heard after not hearing anything was the sound of her crawling up the stairs. So they're very vernacular. Like you, you hear them as individual voices, but but that you're saying that the content, like the time, you said, is unexpected. These these are sort of happening as if singularities could be drawn out for several pages. Mm. This is these are these are portraits of their mm. interior landscape. Yes, they are portraits told as they could tell them if they were to tell them, but yes. not actual thoughts in their head. That's what I'm thinking of. Oh yeah, I think that totally makes sense. They feel like portraits. That's right. In a in a novel that's had a lot of temporal. I don't want to say jerking back and forth, but a lot of temporal moving back and forth from from the present to the very distant past to to other things where you sometimes can lose a bit of track of where exactly you are. Mm-hmm. These are sections that are completely outside of temporality in that sense. Mm-hmm. 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 And I think she's, you know, these this as you said, it happens fairly late in the novel. I think it's about three quarters of the way through. She's she's shown you how how time can be all wobbly. Yeah. And allows you these moments in each of these three women's lives to explore their interiority in that space. And also how that interiority, that subjectivity can be more or less intelligible. So for example, in the second one of these, the one that starts, beloved is my sister, I swallowed her blood right along with my mother's milk. The syntax in that one, I mean, it's intimate, it's portrait-like, it's in a strange kind of temporal space, but 
but you you did never disoriented, you never unmoored. And the first one that starts out, beloved, she my daughter, she mine. Um, there, it's a little the language is a little bit more a little bit more unmoored, right? It, it gets a little bit off the tracks at different moments, but you still are oriented. But then when you get to the third one, especially, it's, it's you know, we're talking about the horror. It's scary, you know, and by scary, I don't mean like scary, like, I don't know, like a scary movie or something. It's scary in the sense that you're, the ground under your feet is kind of gone, right? Yeah. It's, it's largely presented without punctuation. It just spaces to separate phrases. Spaces in the occasional paragraph, mm-hmm. and it it's very hard to follow. Yeah, and it's full of horror. Um, it, the passages evoke this terrifying landscape. I'm going to read a little bit of it. Yeah. We are not crouching now. We are standing, but my legs are like my dead man's eyes. I cannot fall because there is no room to. The men without skin are making loud noises. I am not dead. The bread is sea-colored. I am too hungry to eat it. The sun closes my eyes. Those able to die are in a pile. I cannot find my man, the one whose teeth I have loved. A hot thing. The little hill of dead people. A hot thing. So it's these phrases that, in this section, along with some other parts in the chapter, are evoking, I think, the middle passage of the slave trade. The unspeakable, right, and almost unrememberable horror of the passage. And it's it's horrible, right? It's it's we talk about horror, right? There's horror there, and it's unmoored, and the ground disappears from underneath your feet. But it's doing some incredibly important and powerful work in terms of what's happening with these women, what's being exposed, what's that center of gravity or that black hole or that chasm, right? That that has shaped everything in their lives, right? Yeah, I I feel like after sort of getting through two chapters that were slightly challenging, but not too difficult, that got you really into the interiority and and gave you some of the voices of Setha and Denver. To hit this chapter of Beloved's interiority, it's just just a wall of noise almost. You can barely make out a few threads and a few ideas, and you can pick up a few things that men without skin. I think that's I think this is the first time that phrase shows up in this chapter. She's referring to white people. That's right. And that becomes clarified at the very end of the novel, I think, is, is when I finally saw somebody using it in context that confirmed that that's what that meant. Mm-hmm. But here, it's just this strange phrase that you think, oh, I wonder what that means. I wonder what all these means. I wonder what the teeth are that she keeps talking about. What are, the, what are these references? Have I missed something? Also, a hot thing. I mean, that phrase comes back again and again. And even in the very last paragraph where there's this kind of emergence from this horror landscape where the burning experience of this place of captivity sort of comes to an end. And it goes like this. I come out of blue water after the bottoms of my feet swim. Away from me, I come up. I need to find a place to be. The air is heavy. I am not dead. I am not. There is a house there, is what she whispered to me. I am where she told me. I am not dead. I sit. The sun closes my eyes. When I open them, I see the face I lost. Sethis is the face that left me. Setha sees me, see her, and I see the smile. Her smiling face is the place for me. It is the face I lost. She is my face smiling at me, doing it at last. A hot thing. Now we can join. A hot thing. So this paragraph emerges from that place of horror. In some ways, it seems to be narrating the emergence of Beloved into this world, right? When that woman appears with the new skin and the new hands and the new feet, right? Everything is fresh about her. She's insatiably thirsty, right? And when she sees Setha's face, that's the kind of emergence, right, from the landscape of horror. But there's still this strange persistence, right? A hot thing. And I, what is that? Yeah. Right? It's like, and when we see this insatiable thirst that Beloved has, she's always described like drinking buckets of water, just like wanting more and more water. For a long time, I thought, oh, it's strange. She's like insatiably thirsty, you know, longing to be filled up. And she does get characterized as having this incredible desire, this this hunger and thirst and yearning and desire and this sort of bottomless appetite, right? But now I'm wondering, like, is the insatiable desire for water come from the hotness? In other words, is she insatiably thirsty or is she unbearably hot? Yeah. I mean, that that insatiable thirst is 
mostly when we first meet her, as I recall. Yeah, it persists, though, for a while. I mean, there are a number of episodes where we we keep seeing this. Um, And then it transforms where it becomes other kinds of appetite. Appetite for sweet things. Remember, she constantly wants sugary things, sweet things. And then later on, she'll want all kinds of foods and story and just more and more appetite. I feel like having now read this for the second time, a lot of passages that I found difficult or confusing when I first read them because I didn't know what was being referred to are a lot clearer. The opening, she just throws you into it. Oh, yeah. And and there's a lot of things that are alluded to that aren't fully explained. And now that I understand more of the explanation, I got them. And it was much easier for me to read the opening several pages this time around. This chapter, with its lack of punctuation, with its, with its alien feeling subjectivity, still feels like the chapter where I don't know what's going on. Well, I think that if we follow the language of heat and cool, we get a sense of what kind of work that phrase, a hot thing, is doing. There are these moments that describe a kind of sensation of coolness. So cool water, things like this, you know, that create a kind of sense. For example, Denver has this place that she likes to go early on in the narrative. There's the inside of this really large bush that she goes inside of. It's described as an emerald closet that has live green walls. So there are these sort of cool refreshing kinds of environments, right? But then there's also environments that are characterized in terms of heat um, and and therefore suffering. So for example, when Seth's back has been badly whipped, right? When And when she first arrives 18 years ago, her back is sort of blooming with these angry red marks, right? And, and also the when colors are described in the novel, um, there are a number of passages where we hear about colors that are sort of cool and soothing and then red, which is described as a, a color that's to be avoided or, or dangerous in some way. So anyways, I feel like if we traced out the language of coolness and heat, I think that would give us a clearer sense of what's going on in those moments in that, in that chapter. So it was interesting. I read this book a few months ago, and I'm reading it again just now. And what has happened in between those two readings is that we did a cluster all about food and literature. And so all of the mentions of food in this book just screamed out to me. And I paid <laughs> so much attention to them. And they were all doing amazing work. Did did food also strike you? Well, not quite in the same. Like you, I think you were struck by the many incidents. And I did notice them. But I was very much struck by this one moment. Um, the feast. Right? Yes. There's there's a there's a scene of a feast that's incredibly important in terms of the turn of the narrative because it's like this, it's a turning point. It's also kind of Edenic, right? There's this moment where the older man, Stamp Paid, has gone out and done something rather special. He's gone out and gone to this very difficult, very inaccessible blackberry patch and picked two full buckets full of blackberries and brought them uh, back to the house. And the baby, uh, the the little baby Denver, tries uh, one one of these blackberries and is absolutely loves it. And that's what triggers this feast. The baby's thrilled eyes and smacking lips made them follow suit. Um, the boys sampled one at a time the berries that tasted like church. Finally, baby Sug slapped the boy's hands away from the bucket and set Stamp around to the pump to rinse himself. She had decided to do something with the fruit worthy of the man's labor and his love. That's how it began. Right, And this, that's how it began, is so in retrospect, so ominous at the time, you're like, oh, wow, great. Because she goes on, she makes pies and, you know, makes not just chicken, but turkeys. And it turns into this giant feast where all their neighbors and all the people around are invited. And it's this huge sort of communal gathering. It's like loaves and fishes, right? It's almost Eucharistic. Food for 90. Yeah, it's the most incredible scene. It's like joyous and wonderful. But instead of engendering goodwill and community bonds and something positive, what happens is it opens up a space for envy. It's almost, like I said, it's it's almost like Edenic, right? It's almost like Eden, that something bad comes into the garden, right? There's this feasting, but a bad thing comes of it. I just want to read this bit from that about that. Now to take two buckets of blackberries and make 10, maybe 12 pies, to have turkey enough for the whole town pretty near, new peas in September, fresh cream but no cow, ice and sugar, batter bread, bread pudding, raised bread, shortbread, it made them mad, mm. them meaning the, the townsfolk. Loaves and fishes were his powers. They did not belong to an ex-slave who had probably never carried 100 pounds to the scale or pickled okra with a baby on her back. So it's it's almost sacrilegious, they feel. Yeah. 
Yeah. And this and this feast has been made by Setha's mother-in-law, by baby Suggs, holy as she's known, because she leads sort of spiritual services in a clearing that are very popular with some of the townsfolk. Yeah. And so instead of engendering something positive, it engenders envy and precipitates all the bad stuff that happens. When the slave catchers come out and they're looking for Setha and her children, nobody as would usually be the case, you know, runs out to to sort of warn people when they see these strangers in town, right? Uh, they stand by, they don't really do anything. And um, the slave catchers come and the horror unfolds, right? So it's such a strange moment, right? Because feasting is happening. And, you know, I'm like, oh, I know what to expect. You're like, you know what feasting is doing in books, but it doesn't do that. It does almost the opposite. It collapses in on itself. So I was really struck by that. Yeah, it's a fantastic scene with with delicious sounding d- descriptions of food. There are many delicious sounding descriptions yeah. of food in here. Yeah, it feels. I mean, I don't want to say it feels inappropriate. It feels completely appropriate that you would you would take these moments and you'd savor them, so to speak. But but it's it's striking that as we've said, the sort of the descriptions of physical sensuality that very occasionally occur. You also get these descriptions of culinary sensuality every so often that you know could easily come out of. Hemingway or Fisher or or anyone. Though they differ from those moments, I think, a bit in that they're about feeding others, I think. So in one example, when Paul first arrives and he's together with Setha, she's making biscuits, right? The fat white circles of dough lined the pan in rows. Once more, Setha touched a wet forefinger to the stove. She opened the oven door and slid the pan of biscuits in. As she raised it from the heat, she felt Paul D behind her and his hands under her breasts. She straightened up and knew, but could not feel that his cheek was pressing into the branches of her choke cherry tree. It's the scar on her back, right? Um, and so it, it's it's her act of feeding them, right? That's the, and and the other moments too. There are other food moments that appear in here, and there are also descriptions of people making food for other people. So Denver remembering um, her father, how he loved runny fried eggs. He'd dip his bread into it. Grandma used to tell me these things. Yeah, because she's never met her father. So this is the story that she's heard from Baby Suggs. Yeah, but this is the language of love, right? Grandma said any time she could make him a plate of soft fried eggs was Christmas, made him so happy. Yeah, so so these you know these women who are responsible for feeding the men in their lives, again and again, are making food and thinking about it as as you would. But it gets it gets really how shall I put it? It's it's not uh, it's it's elevated, right? Well, it's it's gift food. You know, it's a very different from the descriptions of food that appear in the women's household when it's just Setha, Denver, and Beloved. And Beloved is insatiably eating everything, and Setha is getting skinnier and skinnier, and Beloved is getting fatter and fatter, right? Um, food is not described in this kind of loving, delicate way there. It's just being consumed, right? It's in these passages of women feeding men that these very beautiful food passages, where food is gift. Yeah. It's also not occurring when men are desperately trying to find food because they're, no. you know, they're on the run. Uh, there's a, a striking passage while Paul D is on the run where he who had eaten raw meat barely dead, who under plum trees bursting with blossoms had crunched through a dove's breast before its heart stopped beating, mm-hmm. which is just such a Oh, that's such a description for a, for a terrible meal. It's beautiful and terrible. It is a beautifully written passage, but it's a terrible meal. There's a, there's a similar sort of less alarming terrible meal when he uh, when he finally gets to to a town and is able to make some money. And it's the first time he's ever made money, and he uses it to buy some turnips. And he gets change for the mm-hmm. turnips, which amazes him. <laughs> and he just proudly eats the turnips, and and they're terrible turnips. Like at the very end of this description, it's revealed that these are dry, terrible turnips. Yeah. But he's so excited for having been able to buy them that it made them all the more tasty. Well, it's women that cook though, right? We like so these examples from Paul D, right? He can get food, he can eat the food, but it's like the food is uncooked, the turnips are uncooked, the meat of the dove's breast is uncooked, right? Unprepared. His heart has hardly stopped beating. But women, they transform one thing into another thing. I feel like We've talked for a good while about this book, and I feel like we've barely said anything. I know. There's so much. We've barely scratched the surface. I know. It's so rich. It's so layered. It's such a big book, and it's such a difficult book to talk about in, in so many ways, but it's such a delightful book. I mean, I have you know, I don't usually read a novel twice in a year, but this is certainly merited that. And one of the things we haven't done is, you know, and we almost always do, is talk about what the book was for us. So we talked a little bit about feeling that 
one might start to feel empathy, but then one feel that it was wrong to have empathy because these people are in such a different place. But I couldn't help over and over again being drawn into thinking about, you know, the mother-child relation and how it's, especially when you're with very young children, right? How, like, you love your children, right? But they're also all consuming. Like, there are times when you almost devoured by them. Obviously, it's nothing like what Setha is experiencing, right? But but there, there are all these moments that, these individual small moments that are feel so immediate, that feel so experiential. Um, I mean, I just kept being struck by that over and over and over again. It was like this double response. I would first be like, oh, I know what that is. Oh, I recognize that. And then the second feeling would be like, no, this is completely different from mm. anything I've ever known. And again, this is an extraordinary writer who can do this, who can sort of pull you in and push you away, pull you in and push you away. It's quite something. I don't know if you felt any of that, because for me, that was emerging very much from the experience of being a parent, like the the physical experience of being a parent, like the being up, being kept awake too long or having to feed or nurse or, you know, jolly or change or all that stuff, right? I mean, it, it confirmed my decision to not be a parent. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, other lifestyles are available. <laughs> but what are we going to be reading next time? Next time, we're going to be reading, again, a, a singleton book, a book we're reading by itself to do something different with, Lee Maracle's Memory Serves. Uh, Lee Maracle is a member of the Stolo Nation of the Pacific Coast Salish people who live um, out in the territory, which is now British Columbia. And um, it's a really interesting book. I'm looking forward to talking about it together. Yeah, we're taking advantage of the new year to bring in some, I don't want to say new voices, but some ex- some voices that have been not usually included in the idea of great books the canon. Well, to talk about other possibilities, yeah. you, know? you know, and we struggled with this, right? Because we talked about indigenous writers and first nations writers and how we would do that. Should we do a cluster that was all indigenous writers? Should we try to put uh, an indigenous writer into each of some sequential clusters, how to do this. And we've, we've been batting it back and forth and haven't found a good way. So we thought, well, let's do this as a, as a, as a one book and think about where it points us. And exactly. See where we get with it. So I'm actually really excited about that because the book I've read a few times now, really love it. I'm going to be eager to talk about it with you and, and see what it tells us, like to listen to it. I think that's going to be really interesting. So yeah, looking forward to that. Uh, she's a really interesting writer, if you haven't heard of her. Yeah. Writer of fiction and nonfiction and plays and poetry, all kinds of things. Yes. And an amazing orator. So that'll be next time. But in the meantime, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm, or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. As always, we'd love to hear from you. Show notes with links for anything we've mentioned in this episode will be at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 22, and The Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So, until next time... Until next time, see you again at The Spouter Inn.